Well, good afternoon and welcome to, to today's webinar. Nitrogen management in cotton, your three key questions answered, brought to you by Cotton Info. My name is Janelle Montgomery and I'm one of the Cotton Info Regional Extension Officers based in Moree. Also with us today is Warwick Waters, Cotton Info Program Manager, who will be helping out with the technology and questions throughout today's webinar. We've got um, quite a few from Southern Queensland and also Southern New South Wales. Um, and well, there's a little few from every valley. So thank you very much for coming along today. And 43% of you are consultants here today, 21% growers, a few researchers and a number of industry peoples. Um, Cotton Info ran their annual research tour in February this year and looking at the interaction between irrigation management and nitrogen losses. We had over 500 people attend the event across seven regions, of which 30% um, of those participants were crop consultants and 50% were gro uh, cotton growers. And there were three questions that came up at most of the locations regarding nitrogen management. And these will be what we'll be addressing on today's um, webinar. So today we're joined by David Hall of David Hall, Cons David Hall Consultancy in Toowoomba. David has worked in agriculture for some 30 years, initially as a field agronomist and later doing extension work across various industries and research and development work in the area of soil fertility and soil health. Um, Professor Peter Grace researches nitrogen manage management and greenhouse gas emissions in cotton-based farming systems. Funded through the CRDC, he examines the impact of agronomic management on losses of nitrogen and gases. So that's Professor Peter Grace of the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane. And we also have Dr. Mike Bange, Senior Research Scientist with CSIRO in Narrabri. As a plant physiologist, he's involved with a number of cotton projects around crop physiology and agronomy, including managing abiotic stress tolerance, um, climate change impacts, cotton systems, and water use efficiency. So if most of you are, uh, are testing fairly regularly. Radio, over to you, David. Thank you. Thanks, Danelle, and um, thanks everybody for attending. Today we're very briefly uh, looking at source dampening, uh, the effect of it on nitrogen specifically, uh, and some movement of uh, nitrogen within irrigation waters. Uh, just to break it up into simple little uh, areas, so the effectiveness uh, as a monitoring tool, soil, soil night sampling, um, there is not really a better way to sample soil nitrogen other than the uh, current uh, methods that we are using. Um, just to briefly discuss things, soils themselves uh, will behave pretty similar um, with regards to nitrogen becoming available, etc. as long as they're within this similar type of soil. Once we start trying to compare soils of different types, even if they had the same starting amount of nitrogen, there will be differences in the amount of nitrogen that will become uh, available or released as uh, inorganic nitrogen. Uh, as a result of this, the changes will happen um, as we go down the soil layers. Uh, and conditions will change, uh, become more favourable, less favourable for mineralisation during uh, winter, summer months, etc. So we just, you know, when we're looking at these things, just uh, bear in mind that not all soils will behave the same with the release of nitrogen, which uh, is a very mobile nutrient, as I'm sure all presenters will be saying. Um, it will be uh, continually made available as well as being continually used. The soil nitrogen test that we'll be doing is very simply a snapshot in time of the nitrate nitrogen that is available. Um, it does not give you any real indication uh, in any way, shape or form as to the soil's ability to provide you with ongoing mineralisation of, of nitrogen. It doesn't give you currently any ability to assess the organic matter. Uh, and how much of, of that will become available through the season uh, of, of the crop growth, whichever crop you're doing. Um, so that's just the effectiveness as, as a monitoring tool. So currently, yes, uh, it is quite dependable. It is a good test. And uh, I 
uh, would promote using it. The source sampling procedure, the main thing to assess first initially when we're looking at the source sampling procedure is to identify any field variabilities. There are chiefly three uh, areas of variability or variation. Uh, number one, it's laboratory. Number two is the field itself. And number three is uh, the temporal or the seasonal variation. Each of these will have different levels of weighting uh, and can contribute to changes or uh, errors in the results. Generally speaking, the field variability uh, is the largest one that will cause this variation. The laboratory results, very small relative to field, as well as the seasonal variations relative to field results, especially in the short term, uh, will not be uh, easily discerned. Generally speaking, any seasonal variations will be uh, overshadowed by what, you know, the field variations that we have. In the soil sampling procedure still, uh, I would generally be promoting these days with the technology that we have a, a systematic uh, approach to soil sampling rather than just a random selection of points. A systematic approach will uh, obviously have a much greater level of efficiencies than random approaches. Other things to do with soil sampling procedures, um, the chemical properties of soils and what we're generally testing are going to be more variable or have a higher level of variability than any physical uh, properties of the soils. Biological properties as well, uh, which are gaining momentum now, uh, are also going to be very uh, easily changed within the sampling time frame. It is worth considering that there are naturally very great variations in the chemical analysis of our soils, uh, whether we consider a large paddock area or just a small sampling area. There will be naturally uh, variations within this. Uh, I would also like to stress here in the soil sampling uh, procedures that we do encourage to do not just a surface sample, but we sample uh, at depth as well, which is according to the active root zone that is going to extract nutrients and moisture from these levels. Number three, the accuracy of the test and results. We talk about uh, the uh, coefficient of variation a lot in our results, uh, which gives you a, a, uh, a confirmation of the variable of the variability of the results around about the average. So to give you an idea, the uh, coefficient of variation or variability, sorry, for pH, the water pH, might have a 2.1%. So generally, the lower the number, the more reliable and closer uh, the numbers are around the mean. So some of the nitrogen levels, the coefficient of variation might be as high as 15 or 20 percent when we're looking at small numbers, especially pasture systems. But as we go to higher nitrogen levels, such as our cropping uh, systems in the profile, the coefficient of variation will probably drop down to about 5 percent. So it gives us confidence that the numbers that we get back from labs are um, reproducible um, and that we can rely on those to a degree as far as saying well in that soil sample that was the amount of nitrate nitrogen that was there. It is worth noting that the labs do do a lot of extra work behind the scenes that is probably not seen in a lot of cases when they verify and uh, test results just to confirm that their reproducibility of these numbers are at a certain standard. Number four, soil testing for nitrogen. Uh, generally, we have uh, one of two tests which are currently being used, uh, the 7B1 uh, and also another test. They are both reliable uh, and they're, they're the accepted methods. There are other methods for testing for nitrogen, such as the seven-day anaerobic test or using carbon-nitrogen ratios. Uh, either of these last two are not necessarily as reliable. They will give indications of the amount of uh, ammonium produced in the first case, or just as 
is a general mineralization rate with the carbon nitrogen ratios, but their level of um, correlation is far less. The slide that you now have, the soil nitrate and variability, is just showing you uh, some results of a, a, a trial I did in the field. It, as you can see, it's looking at nitrate nitrogen. Uh, there are four treatments, T1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. And I was measuring uh, each treatment at 100 metres down from the head ditch. 200, 300, right down to 800, as you can see. You can see in the column across average, uh, an average nitrogen result for the different levels, each being you know, at the same point uh, down from the head ditch, standard deviations, minimum maximums, and the coefficient of variation. So they're just, and this soil was a black vertisol soil and uh, pre-plant, uh, and also with no fertilizer added at this point. Um, it is an irrigated field, black vertisol, like I say, with your general slope, probably, you know, one in eight, nine hundred, something like that. The coefficient of variation is across the field naturally. You can see on the right hand side, um, which do show that naturally in the, in the field, there are quite high levels of variation uh, around whatever the mean or the average is. You'll also be able to see from this how our average nitrogen levels are higher at the head ditch, they drop off going down and then increase again at the tail drain. This is a very normal phenomenon and should always be considered when designing where and when to take your soil samples. Nitrogen losses from the soil system, uh, any of those uh, shown on the slide there, um, are ways by which the nitrogen can be lost. Uh, in this particular session, we're not going to go through all of those, but just basically to discuss number five, soil erosion and runoff, and out of those, principally runoff. There is current trial work that's being done uh, up in Emerald, and it's going um, on for some years, and it's been uh, sponsored by Fitzroy Basin Association. Uh, the, we are looking exactly at the amount of nitrogen being leached out of the profile under a standard application rate and also a variable application rate. What is being shown to date uh, with the results is that there is a dramatic amount of nitrogen being lost uh, after the first irrigation, so that when nitrogen has been applied pre-plant and the system flushed up, our greatest level of nitrogen loss was at this period. After that, in crop, our nitrogen losses were greater where we had the standard rate of application than where we had the, uh, the variable rate of application. To put it in some perspective, uh, the amount of nitrogen that was accumulated uh, in the tail drain as a percentage of the head ditch nitrogen significantly increased um, in the order of say 600% in the case of the standard rate or 400% in the case of the variable rate. So these numbers are not to be uh, dismissed as trivial. Obviously it's an accumulating effect and the nitrogen um, hopefully is, is contained and goes into dams or something, not lost. But as far as the uh, efficiency goes, considerable amounts of nitrogen are being lost in this mm -hmm. system. Um, numbers probably, you know, 15, 20% are probably not uncommon. Just to discuss the uh, nitrogen uh, process of the various bits of the nitrogen in the cycle that we're con concerned with now, uh, we are pretty much just concerned with the nitrification process, which is the bottom right hand part of the screen in blue. So we're focusing on the soil inorganic nitrogen, the, the ammonium to nitrate. Ammonium is a positive charged iron, as I've said there, is quite stable and is generally fixed to the soil. Uh, because of its uh, characteristic makeup there, it is less likely to be uh, lost out of the soil 
uh, its limiting its bleaching potential is limited due to its uh, its form, its ionic status having that positive charge. So it is not as soluble as the other forms, and therefore is not likely to be lost out of the soil system. The nitrite form of nitrogen um, is an intermediate step, um, and it's generally seldom detectable in uh, large amounts in the soil system. Uh, it's toxic if accumulating plants, etc., but uh, it's generally not going to be a, a consideration. The third form, which is the dominant form, the nitrate nitrogen, is a very soluble form. This is the form generally that the plants use, and so therefore it is very subject to, to leaching out of the system. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the nitrogen uh, in this soluble form um, is able to be moved either down through leaching, once again, considerable losses can happen here, as well as the other forms of nitrogen, whether they be urea or the amino compounds can also be lost in this particular form. The amount of loss here will be very much dependent on soil characteristics, uh, the water holding capacities of the soil, um, the textures, irrigation, rain, full amounts, etc. There is uh, just positive correlations between any excess nitrogen supplied and also uh, irrigation waters or rainfall that's supplied on high or excessive amounts of nitrogen. In managing the amount of nitrogen and therefore hopefully the loss, uh, it is probably important just to make sure that we do sample to the effective root zone. Uh, cotton has the ability, whether dry land or irrigation, to proliferate at least two foot sixty centimetres or greater into the soil. Uh, when we are basing our fertiliser recommendations on soil analysis, that we focus on the four R's: right product, rate, time application, and source. Um, we pay essential difficulties when trying to assess nitrogen contribution from organic matter. We we can't really um, say with any great uh, surety is how much nitrogen will be made available throughout the growing season. There are lots of uh, complicating factors. When we are discuss discussing nitrogen management, remember the law of the limiting, as in uh, not to forget about other essential nutrients, whether they be phosphorus or zinc. Uh, and we, there are a wide range of tools uh, online, or etc., or just um, in crop tools to improve the overall efficiency of managing nitrogen and the irrigation in our cotton fields today. Thank you. We'll move on to um, Peter Grace from QUT. Thanks, Janelle. Thanks, uh, everyone, for being online. And thanks to David for giving a good intro to nitrogen. Um, nitrogen is pretty cheap at the moment, but uh, with energy costs as they are, uh, anything can happen and it probably won't stay cheap forever. So what I'm going to talk about is timing. So look, I just want to give some facts that a lot of you probably have already seen from the 2016 growers survey and I know there's a 2017, I'll mention that. But um, again, about across the industry, about 275 kilos of N is applied to irrigated systems. About two thirds of that's applied pre-season. And as you know, that can be months in advance. And that's what I'm going to sort of uh, focus on a bit as I move through. How much are you paying? Uh, could be around $500 a hectare spent on fertilizer. There's huge variation. One of the interesting uh, pieces of information out of the survey is this, 50 to 70%, growers believe 50 to 70% of fertilizer nitrogen is taken up by the crop. Now, let's have a look at some um, data that we've collected on the Darling Downs over the last few years. And this is consistent um, with data across many different commodities as well, not just cotton. Actually, it's not 50 to 70% being taken up, only 12 to 20% of your nitrogen actually is taken up. And whilst this information is the Downs, it's I have no doubt it is relatively widespread, uh, this type of uh, low figure. 
at the end of the season, you could have anything from 13 to 35% of fertilizer. These are average numbers I'm using here across a range of trials where we've actually used highly specific labeled, isotope, isotopically labeled fertilizers. So this is highly accurate. How much is lost? 41 to 57% of that nitrogen fertilizer is lost forever into the atmosphere. You'll never get it back. It's a permanent loss. What do your soils provide? Well, I'm giving a number of 200 kgs of N per hectare, but that's before any losses are factored in. And that number, again, will move around depending on your soil organic carbon, the residues you've had, the previous crop. So that could go from 150 to 300, say, but that's before any losses. And one of the uh, interesting pieces of information, I think, is at which you probably would expect because you can control your irrigation better, is that overhead systems are clearly more efficient re-nitrogen use efficiency. There is more fertiliser getting into the crop in overhead systems. So David's touched on a fair bit of this, but what I'd like to concentrate on is the whole notion of a waterlogged soil. Once you put that nitrogen, once you put that irrigation on, gaseous nitrogen losses occur and they are permanent. Leaching is not a big loss pathway in cotton soils up this end of the country. Maybe uh, bits, there are pockets as you go further west, leaching may come in on the lighter textured soils, but on heavy textured soils, gaseous losses are the, are the main contributor. And, and that is in the form of nitrate. Nitrate is highly mobile. Those losses are dependent on not just the duration of waterlogging, and if it stays there waterlogged for many days, weeks even, if you have uh, uh, another rainstorm come through on top of this or, uh, or a cool period, uh, the amount of nitrogen lost is, is high. It's, it's actually dependent on how much nitrogen is sitting there at the time. So you literally could lose all the nitrogen in one hit if you are waterlogged for an extended period of time. So what I'm uh, going to demonstrate here is uh, applying nitrogen when the crop needs it. Applying it too early, you're going to open up, uh, the potential will be much greater to lose this nitrogen. Before I get onto that, I just want to emphasize, whilst it's really good to have rules of thumb, every year is different. This is every, every region is different and uh, every soil is a bit different. But this is, these are just, um, two graphics, uh, one graphic showing two different years of the trials we conducted uh, on the downs. And you can see in 2016-17, um, to get 12 bales, you had to take up about 300 kgs of N. But the year before, you only had to take up 200. So it's pretty hard to come to, and that was all a factor uh, of the prevailing climate, prevailing weather systems, and the irrigation pattern that was used and the amount of nitrogen applied, all interacting. So it's not a, it's not a simple answer. I'm just going to show here what happens when you put up all your nitrogen up front. And this is where I'm using a figure of 300 kgs of N up front. Now, this is um, the current average in, in 2017 across the, across, uh, the cotton industry and I'm sowing about 30 days later. And then I'm going to apply, in this case, I'm only applying um, about two and a half megs. Uh, this, was in, th this is real information uh, in terms of how the crop has responded and how the nitrogen has, uh, nitrogen has moved. So in this case, we've had put on about two inches at each uh, irrigation. And you can see this is a typical uptake pattern and Mike Banj will talk more about this shortly. Uh, so there's uptake in response to the nitrogen, but at the same time, because it was in there so early, uh, there was about 300 millimetres of rain during that season. 
is an, uh, spread across and uh, the irrigations mean that that's sig a reasonably significant amount of water each time the soils were kept wet and you can see here about 125 kgs of the fertilizer was lost which is a which is over a third of what was applied up front we got an eight bale crop out of this um, in this situation let's go to a different uh, nitrogen and water regime let's spread it out a bit let's put a little bit up front and then as the crop takes off we're adding more nitrogen again it's not ideal it depends when you can get in how you get in i can't say do this um, because if you haven't got the equipment um, it's easier with laterals obviously but and here's a case where we've put water on probably at the other extreme we've spoon fed it and you can see here the nitrogen uptake is much higher than what we saw in the first instance I'll just go back here you can see the yellow this is the same scale the orangey the orange graphic and you can see here uh, it's the crop has taken up the tops weight is much higher how much n was lost in this case of that two when we only applied 250 kgs there not 300 250 and we only lost about 60. so what ended up there 10 and a half bales so that's a significant difference in terms of nitrogen being applied and the yield but again there's more work to be done in terms of putting smaller amounts of nitrogen on so that it and that is a cost whilst you'll save it in the fertilizer can you go out and put nitrogen can you put the water on with these reduced reg, uh, regimes i know it's very difficult so here's um various combinations that have been looked at you can see here nitrogen and water together they dictate what your yield will be and you can see here nitrogen applied all up front which I've shown and um, irrigation 5 by 50 mils 129 and 7.9 bales but as you move down on the left hand side you'll see um, as I'm looking at this, or you, and, I, and you are, sorry, uh, as, you, as you go down, you'll see 300, 300, 250, 250, and then there's a reduction in the amount of water by the time you get to the end. And you can see nitrogen losses have decreased and your yields are up. So in summary, what do I do to increase nitrogen use efficiency? I haven't spoken about climatic influences because this is where your irrigation compensates for dry seasons and you pull back on irrigation in wet seasons. More importantly, I've looked at timing. So applying in later is, is, is a great idea if you can get it on later with less water more often. Again, what I'm proposing here is is all operational, but again, I know the restrictions that can that that are posed on everyone. Soil testing and nitrogen budgeting are critical. You need to know how much nitrogen to put on, and more and more with with the variety across the industry, the different rotations, irrigation scheduling and management. The use of decision support tools is critical. You can look at all these different scenarios in advance and then you can make it an informed decision instead of just using a simple uh, a rule of thumb. Thanks, Janelle. I think uh, that's sufficient. Thanks very much, um, Peter. We're just going to... Um got a few questions here in the question box so I'm just going to hand over to Warwick Waters and he's going to Are you right Warwick yep he's just going to pull these questions together thanks very much Janelle so to um, David and maybe Peter to start with we've got a question here about can extra nitrogen that's needed um, be applied as a foliar spray to adjust 
uh, for stripping out of nitrogen down furrows and towards the tail drain. So yeah. any comment on the use of foliar sprays for um, topping up nitrogen? Uh, I, I, this is Peter. It's, uh, I, I haven't done a lot with foliar spray and um, absorption into the plant. Maybe Mike Bands can provide some information on that. Um, I know the getting it on and then getting it down, it's got to get into the crop. It's got to get, if, it, if it's not absorbed by the crop itself, it's going to end up on the soil. And if it's on the soil surface, it has a potential for loss. So I can't um, come. I can't give you a definite answer on that one. That's that's uh, that's definitely more on the physiology side of things. I don't know if Mike, you've got any input there. I've done very little with uh, foliar fertilizers, other than using them for recovery from things like waterlogging. Um, the, the general principle with foliars are that they're not a they're a supplementary tool to supporting nutrition management as opposed as your as opposed to uh, providing the the adequate nutrition. So the example I, I often use is that um, you know plants weren't designed to take up the majority of their uh, um, nutrition through their leaves. Um, it's a bit like us trying to consume a roast meal and rubbing it on our skin. Um, you know, you might get a little bit in and that might help, but it, it certainly doesn't um, replace, you know, the soil fertility management um, in that context. So they will help, but they are not a replacement for the, the type of demand that are required by modern cotton crops. Thanks for that, Mike. Um, another question that's been asked a couple of times here is about the use of leaf testing or petiole tissue tests. Um, and a comment maybe from you, David, on the use of that testing to understand variability within a field and also whether you've got a comment on whether those tests can provide timely information to react to within season. Question uh, as well, if I know. Um, some of the, the amount of nitrogen that can be absorbed by the leaf and I support the comments that were made previously, but the amount, actual amount of nitrogen that would be absorbed in any one application from a foliar spray is generally quite small, as in it's only a few kilos of nitrogen per hectare that's being absorbed. Uh, the majority of the nitrogen that would be applied in that particular application will hit the ground. Uh, and as Peter said, it then needs a uh, rain or irrigation to move that nitrogen into the soil so it can be taken up by, by roots. So it, it can really just uh, really get you out of a little temporary hiccup. It is not really a provoking way of uh, applying nitrogen uh, per se. So back to um, the other question then uh, about the PDL testing. So the PDL testing Need, needs to be done with a fair amount of discipline behind it um, so that any, any particular um, you know, deficiencies or low levels of nitrogen can be picked up and then corrected later on in the season. There's a really little point doing the PDR with sampling um, you know, if you're involved, so it needs to be initiated and taken on as a program in, in it from uh, squaring onwards, so it can be plotted against the calibrated um, the, the, the taking of the sample, again, as I said, needs to be done with a fair amount of discipline because not only does the uh, amount of nitrogen vary with the time of day, it will also vary with the stage that uh, you're in the irrigation cycle of the plant. So if you are in a you sample it straight when you're irrigated in an anaerobic situation, uh, the numbers will reflect that. And if you sample it the next time when you're just prior to irrigation, when the plants are potentially spread, uh, you, you will also reflect that. So these are just uh, some things to be mindful of if you, you do get PL samples. And that they are obviously once collected, uh, put promptly into you know, field conditions so that they're not left with 
sitting at the youth or the dashboard or whatever for the rest of the day till you get home. So 58% of you are reasonably confident that you're pretty sure um, that you're getting your N application right. And we've got 82% of you um, yeah, are apl applying nitrogen in your irrigation waters. Okay, so we'll just move on to Mike Bange. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks to David and Peter for uh, setting, setting the, the scene for me. Um, certainly much of the, the discussion um, around the availability of different types of N and the, and the, and the losses uh, certainly set up the sort of the story around when did the crop actually um, need the nitrogen. So I'm going to talk firstly a little bit about um, cotton growth and, the, and its demand for nitrogen nutrition. And then one of the other questions is uh, around what happens with the applied water run fertiliser during the irrigation um, and what, if it rains during the night. And Peter certainly addressed some of the issues relating to waterlogging. And I'll talk a little bit more about the waterlogging aspects from a plant perspective. Peter already showed um, an example of a, a growth pattern um, for, a, for a crop. Um, you know, the, gra the, the graph where the line is green is a typical um, biomass or, or dry matter curve um, where cotton grows initially at a, a slower rate and then as it grows more leaves and gets a bigger root system, its ability to grow faster um, accelerates and uh, it accelerates up to a point in time where the season starts to run out or um, either water and nutrition starts to become limiting and growth starts to slow. And, the, the top part of this curve uh, indicates the slowing of growth. And, and in, in essence, the N uptake mimics the growth. So basically, we need protein um, to build protein to, to drive photosynthesis. We also need protein to build components of the plant um, internally. And uh, the actual N uptake, um, the plant's response and its need for N follows the same pattern as the biomass. And just to let you know that I, I'm not making this up, um, I did I sort of refer to some literature that was um, some, some great studies by Mary Arrington, who worked with um, Rocky uh, a number of years ago, showing uh, the graph on the left was the biomass being produced by a crop and the, and the, the corresponding N uptake um, that went with those crops. And these were high yielding um, bulgard crops, um, crops with high retention. And we, we saw similar patterns when, when, the, when the crops were, were not bulgard, just they had lower biomass. So if we, if we break down the, the, the growth curve into sort of three phases, um, I represent the, the, the growth up to the time of flowering, um, which is this early growth um, here where we're starting to produce just, we've got small leaves, um, and before we start to produce fruit, obviously when we start to produce new fruit and correspondingly when we're producing fruit and cotton, we're actually growing, um, to grow new fruit and cotton, we actually have to grow new leaves and stems to support that fruit. And then we get to a point where we reach cutout, where the plant recognises that it has enough, enough water, uh, nutrition um, to support the fruit that are on the plant um, and, and sensing the season length and it actually starts to slow. Um, slow and this is what we talk, we talk about cut out. So the, the red arrows represent the demand for nutri um, and nutrition. So earlier on the, the leaf, the biomass is li uh, little and the demand is, is less. As we start to engage in fruit growth and growing stems, leaves and fruit, the demand is much higher. And then we get to a point where um, we're, we're essentially post cut out, just growing the fruit, not growing new fruit. So if we think about the processes that go um, with those phases, um, earlier on, it's principally about N uptake. Um, in the early phase, in the flowering phase, we have uptake and we do have remobilisation. Uh, it's remobilisation. Uh, if we're starting to get significant remobilisation, we're often running into a, to problems associated with nutrition. Um, but we have to recognise that there is some occurring. And essentially, when we get to cut out, um, both, the, both uptake and remobilisation, that is move, remo, re, remobilisation is movement of nitrogen from stems and leaves um, to support the, the new fruit growth. So 
in just considering the different growth patterns that um, relate to um, different scenarios of, of, of nitrogen nutrition, we've got adequate um, supply of nutrition. And um, I was reflecting on Peter's um, Peter's point about you know getting spreading the nitrogen out and spreading the water out. I I, I grew a crop of sunflowers once, which were three meters high and it was in the middle of a drought so there was plenty of uh, radiation uh, not a lot of water except the fact that i was actually ac ac accessing water from a uh, effluent dam and uh was using um, overhead sprinklers that was wa water in every couple of days and it was because i was providing that nutrition frequently and and, in, and uh the right amounts of water that i was able to grow large amounts of biomass so if we're assuming We've got the nutrition right, those curves sort of match each other in terms of uh, meeting the demands. We get get a situation where we're not keeping the nutrition up. Um, if I look at, we look at the graph on your right with the end uptake, what we see is that early, um, that, that response that represented by the red line means that we start to lose um, and our ability to take up N is limited and correspondingly, and, but it falls a little bit behind in time, we get this uh, situation where we start to get the biomass to lag behind, and Peter showed some of the of the graphs as a result of that. So, what we what we see is we st as we start to lose nutrition, the crop's response are, responses is firstly to lower its leaf area. Um, as a result of having less leaf, leaf area, it produces less biomass and fruit insides, and then and ultimately the plant senses that it doesn't have a large amount of nutrition to support the large fruit growth or the, the, the overall fruit growth, so it decides to stop and has an earlier cutout. So that's a consequence of inadequate um, demand and impacts on new fruit growth. We have a high demand phase with new fruit growth and we have a situation where we recover. And this is Peter's ex essentially Peter's example of being able to, uh, uh, for one, um, as David says, if we use um, soil tests, oh, sorry, um, tests like PDL or not, uh, leaf, Leaf tests are timed to react in terms react in terms of the fertilizer application. So we apply fertilizer here, increase the end uptake, um, and then get we're back traveling on the curve that we were before, and then the biomass um, occurs as usual. So that was that was considering the, the high demand phase and the fruiting the fruiting phase. So let's talk a bit about what happens post post cutout from the same work that was conducted by Mary Errington. Um, we have a a complicated situation in the sense that we, well, with these high yielding crops, in terms of the amount of nitrogen that was provided um, from the leaves and stems and contributed to the final yield or final reproductive growth, it ranged from uh, a very high, the actual the highest yielding crop that was actually the highest yield, some of the highest yielding crops here actually had some of the lowest remobilization or even had the highest remobilization. So these, the crop. At the first crop here at ACRI with 6.3% um, that came from the leaves and stems, nitrogen. Um, it was a similar yield to the ketar crop that had nearly 23% um, remobilization. So the, the complexity around how you actually um, manage nitrogen post cutout is, is, is a little bit of a, an interplay between the end uptake, so if you actually have an end uptake occurring, and the demand by the fruit at that time um, changes the level of um, Remobilization, but you're not limited in a sense. You know, really, the lower end uptake is often compensated by having higher um, remobilization. So it's not a phase that is highly affected by the the end uptake nor the above. And, and, and the statistics show that the end uptake at the time of cutout, um, the amount that's actually in the plant, doesn't necessarily lead to differences in yield. It's actually about providing that nitrogen during that um, high demand phase. So just to, to give you an example of one of the things, consequences of things that happen when you have way uh, more than enough nitrogen, um, if you've, you're not getting the remobilization because it's accessing the nitrogen, um, one of the consequences we see in the growth is not so much the nitrogen impacting on the size of the bowls or the growth of the bowls, uh, which is more about the environmental conditions. We see changes in the, um, the, the constitution of, of the bowls themselves, uh, a little bit around the protein um, proteins often increase at the expense of oil and we often forget that um, cotton is fundamentally an oil seed and this is one of the dynamics that happens with oil seeds and nitrogen. So I'll leave it there but I'll probably talk a little bit more, I'll just quickly refer to um,
the question around waterlogging and the consequences of um, if you do have a rainfall event from a, um, on top of an irrigation event, the, the, the effect that actually occurs, and additional, the thing around waterlogging is really what, what I often refer to as a double whammy. Um, Peter referred to the, the impacts that nitrogen, um, the soil nitrogen environment that is impacted by the waterlogging. But to go with that is that the, the plant itself in a waterlogged condition actually ceases its root function. So actually, if there is actually any, any, any nitrogen present there, whether it be high or low, the plant is actually uh, not taking that nitrogen up. So there are days when the, the plants are not, not getting access to that nitrogen nutrition. So then once the soil environment recovers, it's not waterlogged, um, we have to have the soil microbes um, uh, you know, getting back into balance and the roots actually recovering to, to take that nitrogen up. So waterlogging is a, is a nasty, problem both from the soil environment perspective and the plant physiology perspective. And it's one, one instance where, where if you do, the, the research has shown, if you do sense that there's going to be a, a waterlogging uh, event through a high rainfall situation on top of an irrigation, you have shown that the use of foliar fertiliser applied to that uh, waterlogging event actually does help um, for those few days when, when you're not taking that nitrogen up. So there's one instance where Foliars to, to play a significant role in nurturing it through that problem. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Janelle. And that's all I had to share today. Thanks very much, Mike. Again, I'll just call on Warwick to have a look through the questions. Thanks, Janelle. So, Mike, following on from your comments there, we've got a question here about how late you can go on with nitrogen um, and for it still to get into the crop. Um, so it will... There is, there is no right or wrong answer to this. I think it's a question about when the crop needs it. So the one thing that a cotton crop has evolved to do is take up nitrogen um, because it doesn't necessarily have, know how long it wants to grow. It's a, it's a uh, perennial species. So it will take nitrogen, even when it doesn't need it, to grow new fruit. You can put, you can put the nitrogen on post cutout and it will absorb that nitrogen. It will take that nitrogen off, up and, and hold it in the plan as a, as a reserve. Um, I think the, the, the more important point is is more that the nitrogen, to meet the, not the demands for the crop, it needs to go on cut pre and during that um, high demand phase, pre-cutout. Um, it has post-cutout, the plant has, has its in, both internal mechanisms and it still probably has the ability to take up nitrogen to deal with um, what it needs. Thank you, Mike. Um, another question here, which I'll initially um, target at David, but um, others might want to respond. And it's about, have you seen any difference in deep banding nitrogen versus spreading onto the surface prior to irrigation? Any comments there? I haven't tested soils that have been uh, treated in this way as a simple answer for it. You know, the, the, the effects of it are all responses to whether it be phosphorus or potassium, whichever the nutrient is, especially the more immobile nutrients, it, it would come back to some degree, just what, what are the base soil levels for this nutrient? And then have they been mined over the years? So we've, we've got a stratified effect of that particular nutrient, such as phosphorus in the surface, and we have very low uh, levels of detection at depth. So therefore, you, know, you will probably get a greater response. I haven't myself done any particular soil testing in that in that area. Um, so, any comment about losses of the two different techniques of deep banding nitrogen versus spreading on the surface? It, I, it's Peter. It's um, spreading on the surface. Obviously, um, it, it will there'll be some it'll dissolve and get into the topsoil. But again. Uh, that's the area which will be waterlogged first. When you have deep banding in an irrigated system, you're still getting denitrification at depth. So um, I don't, I, I think the standard technique at the moment of just putting it in, um, whether it's ten, five, ten 10 um, centimetres is probably sufficient because it will, there will be movement. But again, you will get losses. In dry land though, I think putting it in deeper may have some advantages 
because um, you're not getting it. You, you don't have that volume of water there for the losses to occur uh, quickly. So deep band, and I, and I know this is something we're talking about uh, with Mike Bell in grains to uh, get it deeper in the ground. Thanks, Peter. And one last question. Um, do either of you um, advocate for variable rate application of nitrogen? Uh, definitely. If, um, if you're fit, again, you've got to do the sums. And if there's enough variation in your field and the plant is the best integrator of that information. So using sensing, whether it's remote sensing or, or, tractor, or, or proximal sensing, sensors on your tractor, I think it's important because, um, again, when you do the sums, there are some circumstances where the variation is so little, it just doesn't pay. But again, uh, it really, go back and look at your yield maps and see if there is a difference. It may not be nitrogen, it may be disease, it may be something else, but the plant is the best integrator to show variation across a field. And if you can get that information through various non-destructive means, um, I, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. So the work that we're currently doing, which is to go over another season yet, um, did have a significant yield loss, if you like, uh, due to lower amounts of nitrogen uh, towards the tail drain end. So, you know, it, there is a significant economic need in this case to use variable rate. Thanks very much, David. And that was something that came up in the Cotton Info um, trials that we did this season across the industry where we were looking at um, soil nitrogen at the head ditch and the tail drain and getting that um, in most of our soils that of our trial um, farms, we were, we were getting a significant, significantly more in at the tail drain than the head ditch. Rightio. Well, I'll wrap up now. Um, for further information, here's the emails of each of our presenters today. Um, so if there's something that we haven't um, um, covered, you may like to contact them via email. Uh, the 2018 Optimising Irrigation and Nitrogen Research Tour booklet is available on the Cotton Info website. And there's also a number of videos um, that are available um, on the Cotton Info website and on nutrition uh, uh, along with various other topics, but um, go on and have a look at those as well. So um, just a reminder that this webinar has been recorded and it will be posted onto the Cotton Info website. I'd like to thank our presenters, David Hall, Peter Grace and Mike Bange very much for their time today. It's great to have them share their knowledge and expertise um, with the industry. And finally, um, I thank all of you, our attendees, for, for participating in today's webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>